Okay, we're going to cover Chapter 43, Hematologic and Immunologic Dysfunction in Pediatric Patients. This picture to the left depicts the organs of the hematological system. As you can see, we have the thymus, the bone marrow, the liver, the lymphatic system, and the spleen. Now referring to the image to the right, um, erythropoietin mechanism for regulating the rate of erythropoiesis. So basically you want to remember that low oxygen levels or high carbon dioxide levels stimulates the kidneys to release erythropoietin which stimulates the bone marrow and the process of erythropoiesis with the end result being an increased production of red blood cells thereby increasing the oxygen carrying capacity. Production of red blood cells begins by the second week of gestation. White blood cell and platelets begin by eight weeks. At birth, hematopoiesis or blood cell production occurs in the marrow of every bone. Red blood cells, of course, are the most abundant cell in the blood. At birth, newborns have a natural elevation of red blood cells due to the high level of erythropoietin, which stimulates red blood cell formation. Once the oxygen levels in the blood rise, and then the baby starts breathing outside the womb, then erythropoiesis slows down. White blood cell count is highest at birth, but it does vary among babies. You want to see the five types of white blood cells. Refer to them and review them. Platelets are manufactured in the marrow. It's stored in the spleen. Some clotting factors require vitamin K for activation, which should be synthesized by the gut. However, a newborn's gut is sterile. There's no bacteria. So they get a shot of vitamin K to help them out until their intestine colonizes with the normal flora. Let's talk about anemia. So let's first look at the causes and the physiology. This is a depletion of red blood cells or hemoglobin or both. Morphology, characteristics, changes in the red blood cell size, shape, or color or a combination of these. Diagnostic evaluation, sometimes defined as hemoglobin less than 10 or 11. However, this cutoff may be inappropriate for children. Basically, it's decreased oxygen carrying capacity of blood, which results in a decreased amount of available oxygen to the cells and tissues. Blood viscosity depends on the concentration of red blood cells. So decrease in the number of red blood cells means thinner blood and hemodilution. Cyanosis is not usually evident, but could be there. Growth retardation is typically seen in children due to the decreased cellular metabolism and anorexia. This can cause delayed sexual maturation as well. Treatment. You want to treat the underlying cause. Transfusion after hemorrhage if needed and nutritional intervention for deficiency anemias. So for supportive care, we're going to do intravenous fluids to replace intravascular volume. We may need oxygen therapy and then we're going to... Um, request that they rest to decrease the metabolic demand for oxygen. When you get rest your muscles, you decrease the oxygen that they need and clinically they rest because they're fatigued and tire easily. Okay, looking at iron deficiency anemia, hemoglobin levels below normal range because of the body's inadequate supply, intake, or absorption of iron is an indication. Most common types of anemia in children. Most common nutritional deficiency in children. It can occur due to blood loss, acute or chronic, inadequate stores during fetal development, poor nutritional intake, and don't forget about adolescent females who have anemia primarily due to mineralgia. So how can we prevent this? Children need more iron than adults because of accelerated growth. After six months, breast milk and formula do not provide enough iron for a growing baby. They need solid food. Babies are at risk of anemia because after six months their own iron reserve is spent. And if they're not getting the iron they need from diet, they tank. Preemies are at higher risk because they don't get to even build up a reserve of iron. You should recall that it's during the last trimester of pregnancy that babies get their shipment of iron from the mom. If they are born before this shipment arrives, they just don't get it. So what are some of the signs and symptoms? 
These could be for acute pallor, fatigue, irritability. For chronic, we're going to have nail bed deformities, clubbing, growth retardation, developmental delay, tachycardia, systolic heart murmur, and or pica. So for diagnosis, we're going to get a history to determine possible cause, such as whether it's a diet related or not. We're going to do diagnostic labs, such as CBC, H&H, &H, and a fecal occult blood test. And then for normal hemoglobin levels, remember that newborn is 14 to 24, infant is 10 to 17, and a child should be 9.5 to 15.5. Okay, let's treat this. So for treatment, we want iron supplementation and make dietary changes. Uh, iron supplementation such as ferrous sulfate drops are given to babies. And then there's IM iron that may be given to older children. You want to give on an empty stomach or with citrus juices. It's better absorbed. Do not give with dairy products. Stools may become black or dark green. They may have constipation. Iron can stain the teeth, so a straw might be helpful. Iron can be very fatal if overdosed, so have parents do a return demo on the iron dose. And then IM, it's given by z track You want to encourage them to eat more meat, leafy green vegetables, fish, liver, whole grains, iron, fortified cereal uh, at breakfast. Refer to the nutritionist if they can. Get them on WIC. Babies need iron fortified cereal and formula. Most cereals are fortified with iron as well. Okay, pop quiz. Why don't we give iron with dairy products? Well, because it contains substances that bind the iron and prevent absorption by the GI tract. Let's talk about sickle cell anemia. It's a hereditary disease, autosomal recessive, one of the most common genetic diseases worldwide. We look at carriers versus active disease. 9% of African Americans are carriers. They have the sickle cell trait. 40% of Native Africans are carriers thought to be built in protective mechanism to protect against one of the types of malaria. And then we have the Punnett square when both parents have the trait. There's a 25% chance the child will have sickle cell anemia. Carriers generally do not have the symptoms, but symptoms can flare up when the body is under severe stress. Blood of the patient contains a mixture of hemoglobin A and sickle hemoglobin S. Proportions of hemoglobin S are low because the disease it is inherited from only one parent, and then hemoglobin and red blood cells counts are normal. One of a group of diseases termed hemoglobinopathies. It's a normal hemoglobin is partly or completely replaced by the abnormal hemoglobin S, and then a sickle cell shaped hemoglobin occurs. Causes the occlusion of small blood vessels, ischemia, and damage to affected organs. So sickle cell diseases include sickle cell anemia, sickle cell C disease, sickle cell hemoglobin E disease, and sickle cell ischemia disease. So what happens is that on the chromosome chain, there is a substitution of valine for glutamine. When oxygenated, these altered red blood cells have the correct shape, but when they lose their oxygen, it becomes insoluble in intracellular fluid and crystallizes into a rod-like structure. Clusters of those form polymers that bend the red blood cell in response to triggers. If you look closely at the drawing, you can see how the inside of the normal red blood cell is filled with little round dots of hemoglobin. In sickle cell, the abnormal hemoglobin forms strands that bend the hemoglobin, causing the abnormal shape. The red blood cells take on an elongated crescent shape and become rigid, clogging up capillaries, leading to tissue ischemia and infarction. A trigger causes cells to sickle, such as fever, dehydration, stress, emotional or physical, hypoxia, infection. So basically, anything that increases the body's need for oxygen can trigger sickling. Once sickled, cells occlude blood vessels. It causes local tissue ischemia and infarction. Eventually damages tissues and organs. Spleen is the first organ clogged with sickle cells, and children are functionally a splenic by age six. This places them at risk for infection. 
Stroke is also another significant risk. Sickle cells can resume normal shape when rehydrated and reoxygenated. This shortens the lifespan by 15 days. Continuous formation or destruction of red blood cells leads to severe hemolytic anemia. Okay, so for diagnosis, we're going to do a fetal sampling. This is a chorionic villus sampling. It can detect sickle cell prior to birth. Most newborns are screened for a disease at birth during the mandatory state screening. Looking at this graphic, you can kind of see how the altered shape clogs up blood vessels and causes the tissue to ischemia or damage. This is very painful to endure. The spleen and kidneys are prone to sickling damage because the vessels throughout the spleen are very narrow and the spleen's job is to filter or clean up the blood from the damaged cells. Sickle cell is inhibited by fetal hemoglobin. Clinical symptoms do not appear until the last part of the first year of life until the fetal hemoglobin is gone. Majority of manifestations depend upon the type of crisis the child is in. General symptoms include growth retardation, anemia, susceptibility to infection, and it may be an unusual swelling of the fingers and toes. Symptoms caused by enlarging bone marrow sites that impair circulation of the bone and the abnormal sickle cell shape that causes clumping, obstruction in the vessel, and ischemia to the organ the vessel supplies. Pain is a major symptom for these kids and is related to the area of involvement. This picture indicates uh, clinical features of sickle cell anemia such as CVA, paralysis, possibility of death, blindness, hemorrhage, avascular necrosis, hepatomegaly, gallstones, and so forth. Let's look at sickle cell crisis. This is a vaso-occlusive crisis. It's characterized by ischemia, causing mild to severe pain that may last for minutes to days. can affect the brain, the eyes, the bones, the liver, the spleen, the kidneys, the penis, the extremities, and the skin. Splenic sequestration, pulling of blood in the spleen. Death can occur within hours if it's not treated. These kids need to be in the PICU. In kids with recurrent life-threatening splenic sequestration, splenectomy may be a life-saving measure. A plastic crisis has profound anemia, very life-threatening. Look at box 43-2 on page 1369 of your textbook. Let's look at a few of the complications. Brain causes strokes manifested by headache, aphasia, convulsions, and or visual changes. Eyes, they can have retinopathy, retinal detachment, and or diminished vision. Bones, there's chronic ischemia which makes them susceptible to bone degeneration and infection. Liver, leads to enlargement, hepatomegaly, cirrhosis, scarring. Spleen, splenic infarct leads to fibrosis and increased rates of infection. Spleen typically atrophies by the age of six. Kidneys, causes uneuresis hematuria, inability to concentrate urine, penis, circulatory obstruction causing prolonged engorgement, extremities, peripheral neuropathy, weakness, arthralgia, skin, ulcerations. You want to be alert for signs of ACS and CVA. Look at nursing alert box on page 1372 of your textbook. Okay, so let's review treatment in nursing care. Goal of therapy is to prevent sickling and treat the emergencies of sickle cell crisis. You want to instruct parents to be alert to situations that may trigger sickling and avoid such situations if possible. Look at nursing alert box on page 1372 of your textbook. Treat the medical emergencies of sickle cell crisis. Encourage rest to minimize energy loss and improve oxygen utilization. Provide hydration through oral or IV therapy. They may need electrolyte replacement because hypoxia results in metabolic acidosis, which only makes the sickling worse. They may need heat to the affected area. Why wouldn't we want to put an ice pack on it? Remember, cold can trigger sickling, which could actually make the situation worse and increase the pain. 
They may need analgesia for pain. When the tissues are hypoxic, it's painful. So children need pain medicine for the pain. Think about it. When there is hypoxia to the heart, people complain about chest pain. Same principle. Ibuprofen, Tylenol, or Toradol is typically used. Opiates and stronger pain meds can be used as well. PCA pumps with morphine are effective in a sickle cell crisis for older children. Look at medication alert on page 1371 of your textbook and family centered care box on page 1372 of your textbook. Blood transfusion for anemia. If given early in a crisis, it may reduce ischemia. You want to watch for transfusion reactions if they occur and when they, do they occur. Well, they usually will occur within the first 20 minutes, so watch for fluid overload as well. Antibiotics for infection, possibly for prophylactic antibiotics for two months to five years. Look at the evidence-based practice box on page 1369 and 1370 of your textbook. Then we're going to look at monitoring of reticulocyte count regularly to evaluate bone marrow function. It is recommended that these children receive a pneumococcal and meningococcal vaccines as well as yearly flu shots because of their decreased immunity due to the poorly functioning or absent spleen. We also use oxygen to, for these kids to try and prevent the sickling that occurs from low oxygenation. Now they only use oxygen if there is hypoxia. Severe hypoxia must be prevented or could trigger massive systemic sickling which can be fatal. Oxygen cannot reverse sickling or reduce pain because the oxygen can't get to the sickled cells anyways. Prolonged use of the oxygen depresses the bone marrow, which will only make the anemia worse. For additional treatment, we may use hydroxyurea or stem cell transplants. Take a look at the handout from St. Jude's regarding these therapies. This concludes chapter 43, part 1.